Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Village Board meeting of April 9th. Please join us in our Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, Mrs. Thomas. Trustee Willis. Here. Trustee Colton. Here. Trustee Heiberman. Here. Trustee Harris Jones. Here. Trustee Roman. Here. Trustee Open. Here. President Holfeld. Here. Representing staff this evening. To my left, our village manager, Napoleon Haney. To my right, our village attorney, Chris Cumming. To the audience's right, our police chief, Denise McGrath. Fire chief, Bob Grabowski. Village planner, Noah Schumer. Finance Director, Amy Zakowski, Economic and Community Development Director, Angela Maceras, and Public Works Director, John Schaefer. The minutes of March 26, any additions or corrections? Trustee Willis? No. Trustee Colton? No. Trustee Eiferman? No. Trustee Harris-Jones? Nothing for me. Trustee Roman? Nothing. Trustee Oakley? Nothing. May I have a mo motion to approve the minutes, please? So moved. Second. Then moved by Trustee Willis, seconded by Trustee Harris-Jones. Roll call, please. Trustee Willis. Aye. Trustee Colton. Abstain. Trustee Heifelman. Aye. Trustee Harris-Jones. Aye. Trustee Roman. Aye. Trustee Opit. Aye. The minutes are approved. The claims list in the amount of $890,076.92. Comments or questions, Trustee Willis? No. Trustee Colton? No. Yep. Trustee Heifelman? No. Trustee Harris-Jones? No. Okay. Trustee Roman? No questions. Trustee Opit? No questions. I have a motion to approve the claims list, please. So moved. Second. It's been moved by Trustee Colton, seconded by Trustee Willis. Roll call, please. Trustee Willis. Aye. Trustee Colton. Aye. Trustee Heiberman. Aye. Trustee Harris Jones. Aye. Trustee Roman. Aye. Trustee Opitz. Aye. The motion is approved. Of that $890,000 claims list, one item comprises the majority of that list. Our one month's payment for employees' health insurance was $255,000, almost 30% of that claims list. <clears throat> Presentations. At this time, I would like to uh, recognize the Homewood Flossmore Boys Basketball Team. Mrs. Thomas. A proclamation honoring the Homewood Flossmore Community High School Boys Basketball Team on winning the Illinois High School Association Class 4A Boys Basketball State Championship. Whereas, the Village of Homewood desires to recognize those student athletes who bring honor to this village through their athletic, academic, and extracurricular accomplishments. And whereas, the members and coaches of the Homewood Flossmoor Community High School Boys Basketball Team are wholly deserving of such recognition for winning the Illinois High School Association Class 4A Boys Basketball State Championship. And whereas on March 9, 2024, the Vikings defeated the Ironmen of Normal Community High School in a 60-48 victory. The win capped a successful season that finished with 33 wins to only four losses. And whereas the dedication, determination, work ethic, and talent of this group of young men not only made possible a memorable championship season, but also surely point toward their success in every future endeavor. And whereas the Village of Homewood takes great pride in the tremendous accomplishments of its athletic teams that have succeeded both on the court and in the classroom, and this magnificent team performed with precision during the season, earning its well-deserved reputation for high standards of athletic achievement, quality of play, and competitive spirit. Now, therefore, Richard A. Hofeld, President of the Village of Homewood, on behalf of the Board of Trustees and its residents, 
hereby honors and congratulates the Homewood Flossmoor Community High School Boys Basketball Team for winning the Illinois High School Association Class 4A Boys Basketball State Championship and wish them continued success in every future endeavor. We're uh, honored to have the coach, the uh, superintendent, and Nathan Lagardi, a school board member with us this evening. Uh, congratulations to you on behalf of the entire board. Mr. Haney. So um, I understand that Mayor Hofeld challenged the uh, HF basketball team to a free throw shooting contest uh, against me and one of the players, but I understand it will be the uh, actual coach. The unfortunate part of that is I seem to have experienced a scratch <laughs> tweaking my shoulder. Is there anyone on staff that can take my place unsolicited? Anyone at all, anyone at all. And totally unprepared. I'll do it. <laughs> <laughs> you want to set them up, please? Thank you, Noah. I will meet you at the back. All right. Coach, go right up there. This is going to be best of five. <laughs> Nerf basketball. Yeah. The truth is, Coach, <laughs> Coach, we're going to destroy the tapes. The team will never know. Right. <laughs> we'll make and sure he's that. been standing there all day. <laughs> he has been practicing for a week or so. <laughs> Come on up, Coach. Scott, come on up, get the proclamations. Again, we're very proud of you all. And please convey that to the boys as well. Yes. <laughs> during this contest. May I believe it was Aurelio's pizza to the to the winner. The loser must buy. <laughs> For the whole village. <laughs> Not Flossmore, just home much. <laughs> Hear from the audience. If anyone in the audience would like to address the board on any subject not on the agenda, please raise your hand. Yes, sir. Sure, please. So good evening. My name is Bob Griffith. I live at 18840 Center Avenue in Homewood, which uh, for reference is about four houses north of Churchill School. Been there for about 30 years, and when I first moved in, 
I used to come in a few times, maybe on Saturday mornings, to talk about the traffic. Always, always a topic here, right? Traffic, traffic, and the speeding on uh, people fly up and down Center Avenue. And unfortunately, today it happened. A kid was hit by a car, mm -hmm. so we had right in front of our house. So uh, I know initially when I first asked was, can we put up stop signs at Jamie and Jonathan on, on Center Avenue? Uh, there are various reasons why that that hasn't happened. And I understand that in review, but I'm just asking here formally that. I would like to have some traffic calming done on this street. I think the first thing potentially is that Jamie and Jonathan, let's put always stops there. People fly up and down this street and there's there's kids there. I, I mean, there's probably about 12 or 15 on my block. They're all about this, you know, they're all running for their balls and everything. So I'm asking for that at least quickly we can do that. But I think also we potentially could look at things such as uh, raised intersections and other things to slow traffic down. I know we can't have police. We have policemen out there, uh, and I appreciate it. Uh, in the morning, they're, they're, it's crazy out there, and everyone dropping their kids off. But usually, it's just you know people shuffling. But with the speed, it's it's got to slow down. And again, luckily for 30 years, it hasn't happened, but it happened today. Luck, and I will say that it appears that I don't know all the facts. I think the girl is fine. Or let's just say she didn't have serious injuries. I'm going to say she's fine. But uh, so I'm asking formally that we look at the Center Avenue at Jamie and Jonathan, install traffic calming at a minimum stop signs, but I would prefer to have raised intersections. I think people are worried more about their cars and their kids. If we put in raised intersections and blow out their under, you know, undercarriage, if they're going 50, they go 50 miles an hour down Center Avenue. So that's what my request. I think uh, your request is a reasonable one for the stop signs. Mr. Schaefer, our public works director has been taking notes. Uh, we'll be, uh, be in okay. touch with you. Thank you. Thanks. Stop in on a Saturday. Again. Yes, sir. Uh, I am Kevin Crabtree. I'm a resident of Homewood as well, and a uh, resident now for it'll be 11 years next month in May. Um, piggybacking on the comments, I decided to come up today as well because of what I had heard happen near Churchill and um, our daughter is nine years old. So we've had her in the school system here in home with the entire time that we've lived here. Uh, we go to Willow School, you know, for the first few years, witnessed a lot of near accidents. And actually my wife was hit uh, in her car, uh, you know, some minor damage. Um, but we've been concerned about something like this happening. Um, and so we're at Churchill now and uh, every morning I actually try to drive with them uh, to give some calm, some ordinary moments in the morning um, and in the afternoon. But uh, I can't imagine how the family's feeling for this child that was hit today. And there might be an okay report on physicality, but the emotional problems that exist in someone that's been hit by a vehicle, you can't measure that. And it's not just for those who've been hit, it's those who are in fear of being hit. Um, my wife and I act as crossing guards in our street when they want to play. We go out in the street, we play, play frisbee because we feel at least we could be a buffer between cars speeding. And um, it's not just out-of-towners, it's in-towners. It's people that are taking their children to school too. Um, so my point is this. I think this is a bigger conversation than just one street in the town. I feel that there should be a priority on any streets surrounding a school, first and foremost, because people are not getting any better with their habits in driving, and it's generational. People are learning how to do less and less to be careful. So I would advise and suggest and ask, what are the um, procedures to have speed bumps, at the very minimum, installed in the streets surrounding schools? Willow, Churchill, James Hart. I think that at a minimum, that's the most important people in our community are the children, the ones that we need to look out for, number one. Number two, with the traffic dieting that is being proposed and worked through, and I don't have a very good understanding of that personally, I just have not been involved in that as much, but the fear coming from people in town is that that's going to just increase all the side streets, uh, the, the traffic and the, and the dangers in the side streets, and we're seeing it already. I have. We have issues with neighbors that are driving through 40, 50 miles an hour, and we were nearly hit a few weeks ago. We called into 911. Um, 
stop signs as opposed to yields. Yields to most people mean I don't have to stop. And then when they get to that moment, what do they do? So I'd ask you know, for the whole village to really think about this because we're a small, we're, we're, we're a small town, but we're trying to be a bigger small town. And um, we're in between a lot of major thoroughfares. Um, we don't want to see anyone hurt or endangered. And I think it's just a matter of time, but we need to do something and it's very important. So thank you for the time. And I would just ask a conversation about how to get this going. Public Works Director taking notes and the police chief is well aware of it as well. So thank you. If I may, one, one more comment. Um, we know that with the building of everything in town and increasing and, and the businesses and all that, that there's an added need for more policing. So I feel that the idea of the, the, the buffers and the, and, the, and the speed bumps in these areas will help alleviate some of the pressure on the police because no one's being really feeling, I, I don't think people feel that they're being held accountable for bad judgment. So unfortunately, that would poor driving them. habits are everywhere nowadays. Oh, yeah. yeah and absolutely. we've all experienced them, but we're aware of them. Mr. Schaefer's taking notes. So thank you. Thank you very much. So sure. appreciate it. Is there anyone else who would like to address the board this evening? If not, Ms. Maceres, meet your merchant. Good evening. Tonight I want to introduce a, um, one of our newer businesses in town, Wari Taekwondo and Hapkido Academy at 18029 Dixie Highway in Homewood, um, just across the street. But, um, if, would you like to come up and say a few words, please? Master, Grandmaster Kim? Good evening, everyone. Yes, my name is Kwan Pil Kim. I am Grandmaster of Uri Tekunen Hapkira Academy. So I'm very um, appreciate uh, all the community support, you know, what we opening our new location. So actually, this is our fifth location. Uh, Uri Taekwondo starting from 2011 from Madsen and Evolving Park. And the home world is our fifth location. I hope you know, uh, we can help this community, especially, you know, from the young age group. And uh, Uri also keeps supporting, you know, school uh, district as well, in uh, Evelyn Park School District. And Uri have a partnership over six years to after school program. So we've been there uh, school year, and we help, you know, the you know, students who are interested to learn the Taekwondo. And the once a week, and then this is a three-week program. And then um, the parents, they pay for that program, but we 100% donate to school, which means we helping the school uh, district as well. And uh, every year, we also have um, annual fundraising event kick for, uh, called the Kick for the Cure, and we're helping the St. Jude Children's Research Hospital. And uh, it's since uh, 2011. So um, as of the last year, we raised over $152,000. How does a person get in touch with you to arrange lessons? Do they just stop in? Do they go online? What's the best way? I have, I have some handouts that I will leave with you. It has phone numbers and information. Why don't you tell them to the audience because this is being televised. Okay, so our, our school, the location, as you mentioned before, is just uh, right down the street. And we're at 180 29 Dixie Highway. 18029 Dixie Highway. And our phone number is 708 365 6122. And we also have a, uh, a email a website. website. You can go with it's called worrymartialarts.com. So uh, that is on here. It's kind of, I'll, I'll spell that out for you. Worry is W O O R I martialarts.com. And I just wanted to, uh, I've instructed Leo, I'm one of Master Kim's uh, students for over uh, close to 15 years. And um, I started in the martial arts with him at the clubs 
and Evergreen and, and also Matson. I wanted to just mention to you that martial arts is a wonderful avenue for helping students and families and adults to improve their closeness, their skills, their camaraderie. And uh, we have a wonderful family program where we have parents come in with the uh, students. I am a uh, grandparent and I had my uh, grandchildren go through the uh, program. And quite often we hear people and say, well, I'm not putting Junior in that. You're going to teach him how to whoop me. <laughs> I say, no, that's not the purpose. Uh, the kids learn uh, discipline. They also learn concentration. And a lot of the skills that they learn in martial arts are actually transferable to the educational world. And we have kids of different uh, skill levels. We have kids that are artistic. Uh, some uh, have some other challenging issues. But surprisingly, they do well in martial arts. Our instructors go through a, a rigorous training program. <laughs> yes, it is. And that's to make sure that we have, uh, we're following the curriculum, uh, we're teaching alike, and we can take these students in any of our schools and they will be able to assimilate into that school. Master Kim mentioned about the opportunity that we're offering to schools. So if we go to a school and they, and they pick up the program, we have a special design program with about five lessons for the students. <clears throat> Excuse me. They would pay for it, a minimal fee, really, for what they're getting. And all the proceeds are donated to the, uh, the, the teacher organization. So we don't take a profit from them. He also mentioned about how uh, we are community minded and we're, we're interested in helping the community. For about the last 13 years, uh, we have been in the communities and our people come from the communities. We also do an annual event, which is called Kick for Cure. And all the proceeds from that are donated to St. Jude. And he mentioned before that to this date, uh, we raised over $152,000 that went to St. Jude. St. Jude is a wonderful organization that helps the families and they don't, it, it, it helps them to pay for a lot of things. I've had a lot of, uh, relatives with some challenging issues and they are uh, it's a wonderful thing to have them we're right here in the community uh, we're teaching two forms of martial arts it's taekwondo and hapkido it's korean martial arts the students will not only learn the martial arts but they'll learn to speak korean too they'll learn to count in korean and they'll learn some of the uh, cuisine and some of the different cultures so it is a, a wonderful opportunity. I think that if we would uh, use martial arts more in our schools and communities, it would probably help a lot with the disciplinary issues. It builds character, it builds strong bodies and mind and healthy habits, also camaraderie and fellowship with other people. So it's a wonderful opportunity. It's right down here or right down the street. We also offer the classes for the families. If anybody would like to come out, uh, you're welcome to try some of the trial lessons before you, uh, you know, make a commitment to see if, you, if it's right for you. Our members range in age from four all the way up to 76. So again, you're, you're located right across from the Science Center on Dixie Highway. We're yes. right here. Just and if uh, families or individuals want to stop in and just visit and see what you're doing, what are your hours of operation? Yeah, from 4 to 8 p.m. Every day? Uh, Monday through Friday. And Saturday we have a morning class from 9.30 to 12. Okay, so in the afternoons during the week and in the mornings on Saturdays. Yes, yes sir. Uh, we had your ribbon cutting last Friday. And I think you were dazzled by some of my moves. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, so we're glad. Uh, please stop by uh, if, if you would like to try. Uh, in fact, uh, I'm sure Master Kim is not above giving a demonstration now. From, uh, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> you don't have to give up.
but, but please do stop by and help to support us. Um, you, you will enjoy it. It's, it's a wealth of uh, experience and um, keeping you healthy. All right. Thank you very much for thank being you, with us you. this evening. Thank you very much. We can leave those with the same. Thank you again for your time. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Mrs. Thomas, the omnibus vote. The board has asked to approve the reappointments of Lyle Ashford, Phil Dillman, and Bill Wellfell to the rail committee for three-year terms ending April 9, 2027. Board is asked to approve a budget amendment transferring $50,000 from the contingency fund line item to the labor relations line budget to cover ongoing litigation costs. Board is asked to agree to waive competitive bidding due to acquisition through a government purchasing cooperative and approve the purchase of a radio communication system and accessories for public works. Contract is for $176,646.72 with Alpha Prime Communications of Moni, which includes a 5% contingency if needed for unforeseen antenna installation costs. The board is asked to pass Ordinance M2285, granting a variance from the village's driveway standards to allow a residential driveway at 2716 Deborah Lane beyond the three feet requirement from the edge of the garage door face of the property. The board is asked to approve ordinance M2286, authorizing the village manager to conduct the sale or disposal of items deemed no longer necessary or useful to the village. The items include rolling carts, lock boxes, etc., that were left in the former We Ship For You business in the Park West Plaza when the village acquired the property. The board is asked to pass Ordinance M2287, authorizing deletion of the building at 2018-2020 Ridge Road from the lease between the village and the Homewood Science Center. The space was to serve as the Science Center's annex, but the Science Center no longer has a need for the building which originally housed karate for kids before the owner closed the business and donated the property to the village. By deleting the property from the Homewood Science Center lease, the village will be in a position to repurpose the property as a possible commercial or retail site in downtown Homewood. Thank you. I'm so uh, sorry, Mr. President. I forgot to, to uh, ask you, can we pull that last one out, please? Yes, uh, we're you, going sir. to defer item E. Oh, we're deferring it? Defer oh. item, excuse me, item, uh, Item F. So that's not item F. Perfect. It's going to be deferred. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you. Any comments or questions from anyone in the audience with regard to these items? Yes, ma'am. I was just curious the procedure um, with the ordinance that allows you to sell the surplus items that are left behind in a, a village, in a store that the village has taken over. How does that work with the public in notifying them that things are going to be done that way? What, what decision? Does that make the, you know? Our village attorney. Well, notifying the public is what's going on here. As I understand, most of the stuff is, I mean, I'm not familiar with it, but most of the stuff was pretty much trash that was left behind. I mean, there's some, one of the business owners in town, and I'm not familiar with that, said that they were interested in possibly taking, at least taking it off our hands. Otherwise, it might end up in the dumpster. But the process is, is that, um, you know, the. The board can direct the village manager to auction it or do some other things. Sometimes it's worth more or worth less, worth more, worth more in staff time, I should say, than getting rid of the items. So it's really the village manager's call in this case as to what to do. It just seems like that maybe other businesses, not individuals, may need those items as well. Maybe that would be something that whether it be split up or offers them at a nominal cost or just the notification in a little line at the bottom of the home of Congo before the vote on something like that. Even if it's, if you want to write something where it's, the cost is less than $100, then it doesn't need to be done based on your discretion. But for our larger items, I saw that there were some cards and stuff. I know how much those things cost new. They're not terribly expensive, but there may be other businesses who would have been interested, and it's nice to know that everyone was given a fair shot at that. So. And again, I think this just starts the process. 
the board just gave me authorization to do some of the things that you spoke right. about. So that was my second question. This is an ordinance, and that's just an example of the first thing that we've done with that ordinance, or this is just specifically for those items, and this would have to be done again for each time you want to do it. Correct. Is Correct. Correct. This is just specific this is for this item. This is just specific, specific. So this for these is an items. ordinance that's already in place, and you're doing you're going through that ordinance that you have that power, or it's that you're that and you're just doing it for this specific instance, or it's something that you're trying to pass down to be used in other future things as well. Every time the village wants, to, or every time the village has surplus property, the village has to the village board has to approve it by an ordinance. So this is not something that's ongoing. This is state law. There, the board can't just give things away. It's got to be done by an ordinance. So this is not an ongoing policy of the village. This is uh, the board following state law as to how to. But there's no pre-notification needed for that of the yes. item stock or the other people there. It's just the notification that something has been decided and whether it would be passed by the board. It's being true. If the board approves the ordinance, then it's going to be up to the village manager as to what steps he needs to take next in terms of disposing of the property. Because I, I thought I read in the agenda that it was a specific person that had already been decided to go to. So I guess that's where my question is, is how do those individual business owners know that there's something that may be available that they're interested in to contact the village manager about? Is it just, I happen to live next door to that building? or? I'm a buddy of somebody that owned the previous building. I peeked in the windows. It's, it, it could have been all of the above, but right now we have a similar business that has shown interest. But like you're saying, I could definitely share this information, uh, solicit some additional interest, and see what happens. Absolutely. Okay. Thank you. So are you interested? Would you like? No, I just thought about other businesses as they open and close, you know, restaurants, things like that, maybe some of the other smaller ones to get a put up, you know, if they they could utilize those things. But from some of the people I've talked to and other local business owners, they were unaware that you could just look in a window of a closed business, see something you might need, and contact the village and say, Can I get that? So, the difference you know, here just to the the difference here is that the village ended up with the property in the first place. The village doesn't have control over things that are in other closed businesses. Right. The only reason that the village ended up with this property in the first place is because the building owner didn't pay taxes for many years. The village is trying to get the property back in the tax rolls and also redevelop it. So that's the only reason that the village even ended up with this stuff. They didn't, the village did not intend to end up with this stuff. They ended, intended sure. to take over the property to get it to be redeveloped. So this is kind of a one-off situation. It's not something where it happens every day. This is the best way of putting well, it. But as the village does acquire the properties that have been smaller or larger than this property, there may be items or things in those properties. That's why I'm wondering what the process was needed to explain that. Okay. Anyone else would like to address the board? If not, board comments with regard to everything except item F, which has been removed. Trustee Willis. Uh, I did have a question about the communication system. Uh, I just w wanted to know what what it, what is it replacing? With? How is it an improvement? We currently have a radio system that's uh, over forty two years old. Uh, the manufacturers are no longer making radios that on the frequency that we're at. <clears throat> uh, we've been without a uh, base station uh, in public works for over three years. So uh, the only way we can contact uh, vehicles on the street or whatever is through another vehicle. So we looked at uh, several things going on in the county system, uh, which has a, a network countywide. Uh, we're not able to get onto that system because it's strictly reserved right now for police and fire. Uh, maybe in future years we might be able to. So we need to do, uh, get a communication system that we could either use anybody in the office, uh, in the uh, uh, administrative staff or whatever can contact uh, uh, vehicles or individuals out that are working out in the field. So we went out to uh, look at several different uh, uh, applications of it. We looked at uh, one, of the, one of the major manufacturers and what the price of those uh, 
radios would cost, and we also looked at alternatives because of the price of those radios. Um, the, uh, the Motorola radio that uh, is kind of standard for the industry is not something that we can afford uh, for our type of uh, facility and, and what we use it for. Uh, so we looked at alternatives. Uh, we did find an alternative, uh, Tate Radio. Uh, it has been uh, bid out through uh, government purchasing contracts, which allows the village to buy off of those contracts. We can buy those radios about half the price. Uh, they are rugged radios. They look almost identical to the Motorola radio. Uh, they are used by other uh, municipalities throughout the country. In fact, the uh, city of Los Angeles uses that same type of radio. Uh, so by doing our homework and uh, doing our research, we've been able to uh, save half the price of what we originally had budgeted for. Thanks. Trustee Colton? No, I'm fine with everything. Trustee Eichmann? Nothing. Trustee Harris Jones? Nothing. Trustee Roman? No questions. Trustee Oak? No questions. I have a motion to approve the items A through F, A through E rather, on the consent agenda. So moved. Second. Moved by Trustee Colton, <coughs> seconded by Trustee Roman. Roll call, please. Trustee Willis? Aye. Trustee Colton? Aye. Trustee Heiferman? Aye. Trustee Harris Jones? Aye. Trustee Roman? Aye. Trustee Open? Aye. The consent agenda is approved. Old business, Ms. Maceras. Um, on old business tonight is the extension of the letter of intent for 3003 to 3. 25 183rd Street, which is the Park West Plaza, um, also also I think described as the American Bagel Plaza. For reference, in February of 2024, the village approved a letter of intent with Rabbit Ground LLC for the purchase and rehabilitation of the property. Um, the letter of intent um, was to hold the property for 90 days and is due to expire on May 7th. The developer has requested an extension of this due diligence period for an additional 180 days until November 9th of 2024. Since that time, staff has been working with the developer and with Rabbit Brewing to refine the incentive request and the, their performa and to work through um, some of the costs. We have discussed terms um, of the future redevelopment agreement, and I believe we are in agreement on those terms. Um, those, some of which include the sale of the building and property to Rabbit for a dollar, support of Cook County Class 8 incentive, which will reduce the property taxes to approximately 60% of the existing amount, a rebate of the places of eating tax for five years, and um, a contribution of $300,000 towards the build-out of the brewery. These are all um, under negotiation still, and the next step would be to approve the redevelopment agreement and a purchase and sale agreement. Both items will come back to the village board when we finalize those terms. Um, the property is currently in the Kedzie Gateway TIF. The village has completed the process of establishing a new 183rd West TIF, which would include this property and the former Brunswick zone. Um, it is to the benefit of both the village and the developer that we delay the redevelopment agreement and sell the property after that new TIF is established. Um, for the four incentives, and then, um, but staff would recommend that we extend this letter of intent this evening. The developer is here, Mr. Steinmarch, Rabbit Brewery, sir. Come on up, please. Um, yes, sir, Mr. Mayor and Board, uh, we have been working diligently with the property and uh, uh, there's a lot of improvements to be made obviously over there and uh, so we've been in there with architects and plumbers and all sorts of people trying to figure things out for the future and we're getting closer and then of course uh, the municipality just got access to the one last store that was on the far west end and so we've been in there over the weekend uh i know angela wishes i would stop going into these places all the time but uh we're 
close with uh, architecture and engineering and so forth. Uh, the time we're asking for now is just to finish up and come back with an RDA to the municipality. An RDA is a redevelopment agreement. Uh, for the benefit of those who are in the audience, would you tell us what your plan is for the entire center? Uh, actually, the brewery will take a substantial portion of the center. The West End. That's correct. The West End, the bagel shop will stay where it is. The State Farm shop will stay where it is. And we'd like to keep the uh, uh, tailor as well. Uh, we may have to move some things around just to get it all to work properly, but uh, we'll, uh, uh, these people have been uh, tenants before, and they haven't always been treated as well, maybe as, as they'd like to be. And so their goal is to treat the tenants in the center very well. And so that's what we've been instructed to do with regard to costs and so forth. Anything you'd like to elaborate? We're excited to continue with the process and uh, we're really looking forward to the move. Comments or questions from anyone in the audience? Board comments. Trustee Willis. Well, um, I wasn't present when the uh, an initial um, the letter of intent was discussed, and that was 90 days. Um, so there must have been some issues that couldn't be resolved in the 90 days. We're expecting those issues to be resolved with the additional time, or are we confident that that's going to take place? There's a lot of uh, building a restaurant or a brewery. There's there's quite a large amount of work to be done in the floors and so forth with regard to the sewer, and we've been having things televised and uh, the grease traps and all sorts of crazy things that you're required to do differently now than you did before. And so that's what we're working on. Thank you. Trustee Cole. Um, I just have a couple points of clarification first, um, probably for Mr. Cummings. Uh, one is the letter of intent. Um, is this, this isn't binding, right? Like the stuff, like we're just saying, we're just pressing pause for six months. We're not agreeing to anything. Right? Correct. Okay, so. You're giving them time. Right, so I mean, so yeah, it's gonna be a very easy yes for me. I just wanna get a couple of other things clear. Um, the other question is, all right, because I want to get into a couple of the terms. Actually, before I get into a couple of the terms, I want to just say I'm the biggest fan of this whole project, and I want to find a way to make it work. I really, really do. Um, Rabbit Brewing, it will, in the interest of uh, full transparency, Ray and Tobias are friends of mine, um, but nothing I'm about to say has anything to do with our friendship. It has everything to do with my respect for them as a business, and the fact that not only do you have an excellent brand, not only do you have incredible integrity and an ethical business sense, but you are so present in our community. You know, every event, every, I mean, whether it's for the village, whether it's for the Bel Canto Choir, whether it's skating in the roller derby, like you guys are part of Homo. And that's why I want to partner with you because I think that you bring a lot to our community and I want to help you do that. Um, one, I want, but I want to dig into a couple of these things because we also have to find something that's going to work for the whole community. You know, it needs to be something that's going to be beneficial to you, but also beneficial to the uh, to the taxpayers. And um, one of the things that we have is the uh, uh, giving you property for a dollar. Now, is there like okay? Because you can, you can, you're, the plan is for you to collateralize that, right? Okay. In the event, and I hope it doesn't happen, but in the event that it goes into foreclosure, do, will we just lose that property? Like, what this is be? all part of the redevelopment agreement that okay. we'll be looking at next. Okay, because I just want to make sure I understand, because no. I want to be able to give them sort of signal flares of kind of how I feel about that. I just want to make sure, that it's, so it is my understanding correct? It's the village's practice when we do something like this, when we're selling it for below market, that in that redevelopment agreement that there would also be a reverter deed that would come back to the village in the event that they didn't carry through on the property as they were supposed to, um, in, in terms of honoring the terms of the redevelopment sure. agreement. But if, if, if they've collateralized the property, will that clawback still like work? I'll be honest with you, we can talk about it offline, but it's difficult. Okay. okay. All right. The difference, though, is if it goes into foreclosure, you've got a building that's actually 
ready for some other unfortunate, I mean, in the unfortunate event that they didn't succeed, the building is going to be in much better shape than it is today, right now. Oh, good point. Okay. That's, I mean, yes, the village is selling it for a dollar, but it's coming with um, some caveats, you know, guide rails that come with it. Right now, it's going to be very difficult to develop if, the, if somebody doesn't uh, invest something in it. Right. Well, and to be honest, like my instinct is that, yeah, we might, I mean, you guys have a lot more at stake than we do. You know what I mean? Like we're all in this together. We we'll actually have about $2 million in the upgrades right. and improvements. Which is why I'm inclined. I just want to make sure that we understand yeah. exactly what every, you know, what the risks are and stuff like that. But I think you guys are worth the risk. I really do. I think that that is, I, I feel very strongly about if there's any business that I trust, it's all y'all's. Um, the only thing that I do really have an issue with and I hope we can work through in the next six months um, is I'm very uncomfortable with the $300,000 coming out of our general fund. Um, I don't mind, like if this were TIF money, no brainer, you know, because that's what it would be for. The general fund makes me nervous just in terms of a general, just as a policy, I feel like that's taxpayer money. That's like to run the village. That's to pay salaries. That's to, to, to do the stuff that you put out the fires and, you know, the stuff that we need to do. Um, I'd love to find a different way to either to make that work, because that's where that's going to be the sticking point for me. Um, like, oh, like I said, I'm signing tonight for sure. And I'm open to being talked into things like I'm always ready to hear if you can change my mind, I love getting my mind changed because it means that I'm getting smarter. Um, so I'd, I'm going to, but I just want to send that sort of signal flare out so you guys know that that's kind of what's going on in my mind. But in terms of tonight, 100% excited, 100% yes. Trustee, hi from um, I want nothing more than to see the property get redeveloped. You know, I, I share everybody's caution, um, and I'm hoping we get a really comprehensive, you know, a full comprehensive plan to make sure that we're all doing the right thing and look forward to seeing what you come up with. Trustee Harris Jones. Look forward to seeing how much you guys come up with. Trustee Roma. I understand the concern, but I also um, want to say that a business like yours that has been so successful in your current location, I can't possibly imagine isn't going to grow significantly in your new location. Um, and to everything that Trustee Colton said, you guys are such an anchor in the community <clears throat> that I can't, I can't see this not being successful. I understand the caution entirely. We've been burned by situations like this, which is what causes us to ask these questions. But I support extending the agreement, and I'm equally as excited tonight for you guys as I was when this first came to us. Trustee Oakley. I'm very excited for rabbit Road to continue to grow. I'm so glad that there's the extension and um, very excited to see the next step. So thank you. And as uh, Trustee Roman said, you are an anchor in the community and we're very lucky. So thank you. What we're looking at this evening is a letter of intent uh, for your additional period of due diligence. Uh, you all have worked very hard to uh, try to come up with uh, some ways of making it work. I'm sure you'll refine it. It'll get better. And with all that being said, may I have a motion to approve a letter of intent uh, for Rabbit Brewing? It's the amendment. An amendment to the letter. So moved. Second. Been moved by Trustee Heiferman, seconded by Trustee Colton. Roll call, please. Trustee Willis? <coughs> Aye. Trustee Colton? Aye. Trustee Heiferman? Aye. Trustee Harris? John? Aye. Trustee Roman? Aye. Trustee Ogle? Aye. Motion is approved. Thank, Thank you all. You. Thank you. See you back to here uh, in 90 days or sooner. 180. 180. New business capital improvement plan for the upcoming budget. Totally show no. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't been practicing. You know, Amy, Amy, before you begin, there's a, a gentleman in the back I want to give some recognition to. Uh, Eric Baker is a young man who has been the coordinator 
for the Homewood Flossmoor Special Olympics, which most recently raised how much over $15,000? $18,000. You're a wonderful part of the community. I want to recognize you for that and go home and get to sleep. to provide some context before Amy gets started. Just wanted to read a few things. So over the past few years, staff has worked to increase our and enhance our fiscal and financial footprint. We've introduced and you have approved various initiatives that we believe enhances the village's financial footing. I can honestly say that the village is in a really good financial position. Some recent examples, we created a five month reserve program policy, which increased our fund reserve from four months of operating to five months of operating funds. We created a policy that prioritizes the use of fund balance with the first option being to consider using the fund balance for capital projects. The second option uses fund balance over the five months reserve for economic development initiatives. And the third option uses fund balance to provide additional funding for public safety pensions. We even created a small emergency fund that covers the cost of unforeseen and emergency operational costs that, that's funded to the tune of roughly $240,000 each budget a year. Most recently, as Amy will present, we're in the process of creating and refining a five-year capital plan. Normally, our capital plan only shows one year of capital. Now, the plan, once refined, will provide a more comprehensive look at the village's many capital projects to afford for better decision-making for the mayor and board. With that, I would like to introduce our favorite, the most important, Amy Zukowski, our finance director, present our five-year capital plan draft. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> Should we clap? <laughs> yeah, pretty much. You guys we'll save it to that for that. You guys missed out. I'm sure you're all very excited for another PowerPoint presentation from me. So, um, so as Napoleon mentioned tonight, we're presenting to all of you the our initial five-year capital improvement plan. So I just wanted to first kind of define what is a capital improvement plan. Um, it helps to lay out the financing and timing for capital improvement projects over several years. Um, and it can help bridge the gap between the planning process and the budget, budget process. It can help our local leaders plan for the future based on specific goals and resources. And it can be a working document that should be reviewed and updated regularly to reflect, reflect any changing needs or priorities um, and funding opportunities that we might come across um, that can help us anticipate needs rather than reacting in the moment. So beginning this next fiscal year, the village will begin to utilize this five-year capital improvement plan. Uh, we will use it to help us organize, budget, and assist with decision-making when we discuss our capital projects. It will help to establish a plan that will outline the capital needs of each of our departments while identifying the resources and processes necessary to fund those capital projects. And the plan will be a dynamic template that can be reviewed and updated throughout the fiscal year. So even what we're showing you tonight, we're still we're still fine tuning that. So while the projects may remain the same, there may be additions, there may be some movement around of those projects um, when we bring it to you next. So we started the process having each department submit their capital project needs for the next five years, and we asked them to prioritize those projects based on four priority groups. Uh, the number one priority group would be considered essential. So that's urgent, high priority. It addresses an immediate need or remedies a, a condition um, that we're seeing. Desirable would be still high priority as long as we have the funding available. Acceptable, um, worthwhile if we can fund it, but it's okay to push it out a year. And then deferrable, um, again, can, is low priority and can be pushed out. So the first year of our capital improvement plan will be our actual capital budget for the next fiscal year. So while you're seeing the five-year plan, that your first year will be what is put into the capital um, budget uh, for fiscal 24-25. So the, how do we fund our capital projects? So 
We're the village is limited in our funding sources. Um, so one of the first options, and really it's historically been our main option, is to issue a non-referendum general obligation tax bond. Um, because we are a non-home rule community, we're limited in what we can issue as far as debt without referendum. So approximately $2 million can be issued every three years. Um, another option that became available to us over this past year was have, using some of our reserves that were available um, over our minimum fund man, but five month reserve policy. Um, when we updated this policy, we prioritized if we were to have additional funds available over our five month minimum requirement, what would we do with them? And the number one priority was to fund capital projects. So we were able to move some money um, from the general fund to the capital fund. Um, but I just want to remind everyone that's not a cons consistent funding source and it shouldn't be relied upon um, as such either. Another source is through the water sewer fund. So the water sewer fund operates, we've said this many times now over the last several months, um, operates on its own like a pri as a, a private business. So the money that we collect through water bills is then used to pay for the operating expenses within the water sewer fund and capital needs. So currently we have, um, we transfer about $1.6 million of that revenue collected to capital each year. 1.6 million gets us through pretty much one year's capital needs. So we're not continually adding to build up that balance to cover some future critical larger infrastructure needs we'll have within the water sewer fund. Um, another funding source that we were fortunate to receive was the American Rescue Plan Act funds, so ARPA funds. Um, again, this was kind of a one-time injection to the village. We received about two and a half million dollars. To date, we've spent just about half of that. Um, we are coming up upon the timeline where we need to obligate any funds um, that we haven't spent by the end of 2024. And then at that point, we have to make sure we spend those dollars by the end of 2026. So um, we don't have a, a lot left to spend, so we'll be working through that um, in this next fiscal year. And then of course grants, we're always looking um, for grants that may be available from federal, state, local, private grants um, that we can use for capital projects. But often with that, there is a matching portion that the village will have to fund. So we always have to keep that in mind. If we get this grant, what is our share and can we, can we fund that? So our current five year, capital improvement plan that was part of the agenda packet totaled about three thirty three and a half million dollars in total projects over the five years. Um, some of the funding available is we have our previous bond from 2020 there's still about $400,000 left to spend so we want to get that money spent down and the reason it's available is a variety of things, but we were kind of focused on ARPA funds some projects. Um, roll over year to year timing, you know, if there's a bid process, you know, we're not always able to get through everything in a single year. Um, vehicles, they've been hard to come by lately, so that can delay spending those dollars. So we've, we've, um, we're going, we're planning to budget so for some vehicle replacements, possibly some IT upgrades, um, the Homewood Science Center potentially will be uh, resurfaced using those leftover funds. In general capital, so this is the $2 million that we were able to take from our reserves and move it over to capital in December. Um, majority of the projects are being that were allocated for use of those funds are being rebudgeted in the new fiscal year. Again, it's timing. We didn't move that money till December. It's not a whole lot that we could do, especially if we have to go through a bid process um, in the remaining few months of the fiscal year. So some of the items that were tagged to use that general capital money is the street rehabilitation for Marlin Lane, uh, village-wide camera replacements and improvements, uh, Ridge Road storm sewer, auditorium HVAC. And again, kind of some of these projects might change buckets, but these are some of the key projects that we were hoping to work through in the next fiscal year. Uh, we're, we're recommending that we move forward with uh, our next bond issuance in this coming fall. Uh, we did delay that. We could have bonded last fall in 2023, but that we did delay it when we moved over the reserves um, from the general fund to capital. The next bond will provide us about $2 million. Um, that $2 million has to last us for three years. So it doesn't, it doesn't go far. It's not a lot of money. 
Um, we certainly have more projects than there is funding available through that $2 million bond. Um, so that's kind of still what we're working through the further prioritization of what projects we would want to fund with that money. Some of the, uh, some of the projects that might fall under that are resurfacing and lighting the two metro lots um, that the village now owns, uh, possibly resurfacing 183rd Street, and there is an ambulance that's due for replacement um, in the next several years. If we are to bond in the fall, we would look to continue that process, which would be every three years. So 2027 would be our next ob uh, general obligation bond year. Um, it, it's critical that we can keep in this routine because again, historically, that's been our only main capital funding um, source that we have available. Um, one large item would be a fire engine that's due for replacement in 2028, I believe. We have that currently estimated to be a million dollars. Uh, Chief Kowalski will tell you that's not enough um, after we're hearing what other municipalities are spending now. And if we're not looking to do it to 2028, that cost is just going to continue to rise. And again, our bonds are only approximately $2 million. So just by having the five-year plan, we can see the broader picture of what's coming down the road and how might we be able to um, fund some of these. A couple of other um, funding sources are through our motor fuel tax fund. So this is money that's allocated to the village from the state that's generally been used for the village's street program. Um, could be patching and or resurfacing. Um, we also use some of that money to purchase salt each year, um, each fiscal year. Uh, we, we have been utilizing a patching program and it's been working for, for, for a while, um, but we do need to consider Full village-wide road improvement program and how how we could fund that. The motor fuel tax fund alone wouldn't be sufficient to do that. So that's something that's on the horizon that we need to all still uh, kind of start considering. And then within water sewer capital, so our current balance in that fund is about two million dollars. We had built up that balance, um, and we were able to do the water transmission project from Harvey to Chicago Heights, um, paying cash 12 million approximately 12 million dollars but that obviously drained our fund balance a bit so we know we have some significant capital projects that are going to be funded in the future one is central water tower replacement um, lead line service line lead service line replacement project huge um, mandate from the federal and state um, approximately 30 million dollars over 17 years will require obviously multiple funding sources and a lot more discussion. Um, we would like to bring to the board at the early part of the new fiscal year um, the possibility of doing a water rate study so we can really capture all of the needs, the current and future expenses, both capital and operating, and how our funds, are, our rates are going to map, line up with that. So by implementing this five-year capital improvement plan now, um, we'll have this important planning and fiscal tool that we can use and revise on a regular basis and continually to reflect the needs and resources that we have available as things change. Um, again, like I mentioned, we do have some critical infrastructure needs um, that we need to be considering, such as the street improvement program and lead line replacement program. So there will definitely be further conversation needed throughout the fiscal year. I just wanted to touch on the ARPA funds. I know we, we kind of talked about it a bit that we received the two and a half. We've got about half of that to still spend. The goal is to get that complete, as much completed as we can by the end of the calendar year. Otherwise, there's a process we need to go through with the treasury in order to make sure that we're, we obligate those remaining funds so that we don't lose them. Um, so we'll make sure that we're in a good spot um, come that time. And we, there's about 34,000 of ARPA funds that we don't have allocated. We would recommend that we kind of leave that as a contingency should some, any of the other projects come in potentially over budget um, that we have that funding available. If we end up not needing it, we obviously would have discussion about how we would want that to be spent. So the next steps would be opening it up to any questions that we have that you may have related to the five-year capital plan. We have all of our department heads here, so they would definitely be able to answer um, more specific project questions um, than I would be able to. So I plan to be here again at our next meeting if you're not all tired of me and we'll be bringing back um, 
the full budget. It will include the capital plan and we'll have our budget hearing on April 23rd, followed by the uh, ordinance for board approval. What a concise, informative presentation. Really very well done. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Comments or questions from anyone in the audience with regard to capital spending? Board comment. Oh. Yes, sir. Um, pertinent to the reason why the two of us spoke earlier about um, safety in the, the streets, um, are those type of projects part of the discussion for street improvement in terms of safety and if need be speed bumps or elevated intersections, things of that nature, are they in consideration as part of the budget? Currently not part of the budget as it stands right now as part of these projects, but I think, John, maybe you can answer better as an overall road improvement program if that were to be taken into consideration. Uh, for your request regarding speed humps and things like that, <clears throat> there would definitely have to be some neighborhood discussions regarding that. Because as we all know that sometimes it's a good idea, but the problem is, is I don't want that in front of my house because of the noise it creates and everything else. So there definitely have to be some discussions with the neighborhood, discuss what options may be out there, and then from there develop some type of cost estimate and what it would be to make those improvements. Uh, so right now, there's nothing that's planned in the budget for any of those uh, road humps or speedway humps, but we'll definitely will start looking at that. And, and once again, as the uh, finance director said, there all there's always going to be some modifications uh, made to the budget as time goes. Any other comments? Mr. Willis, just want want to thank you for putting this together. It's such a valuable planning tool and uh, I can tell a lot of work and effort and thought went into it and we appreciate that. I appreciate that. Just mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely appreciate it. Um, we had a deeper conversation about some of this stuff yesterday and um, most of my questions were answered if everything is, is laid out really well. The only question I had was a question for you, Mr. Schaefer, um, in terms of, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> you're a popular man tonight. Um, quick question, because I just remember, like, when I was on the board before, like 10 years ago, we were talking about some third edition sewer mm -hmm. stuff. And then I just wonder, what's the status of that? Because I, I know that that could turn into a capital situation. Well, back then, I think that was in 2009. Yeah. <clears throat> uh, we talked about that. We did a study on that. We hired an engineer to see what the cost would be. We actually held some public meetings on that. Mm -hmm. uh, those meetings, some were in favor, some were not. The cost at that time was $17,700,000. If you extrapolate that out and just add 3% to that, uh, you're looking at uh, 20, $27 million right now. Uh, so that is something that would be up for later discussions on uh, what we want to do. The, the problem is not going away, uh, right. it'll still be there, but as <clears throat> Amy talked about, uh, you know, we have to look at how we're going to fund these projects. There's right. major projects out there, the, uh, you know, we're starting to look at the lead line replacement and what that's mm -hmm. going to require, and uh, just for some uh, newer estimates because of it's happening across the country and what we're seeing with material and contractors and everything else supply and demand oh, uh yeah. that 30 million could actually triple yeah. so you know and how does a it, it's almost unrealistic uh so you know maybe the feds and the iepa will make some changes i don't know because a community our size you know, how would we go about affording that? You know, the, the burden it would put on the residents and everything else is astronomical. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's gonna have to be some definite major help from the feds uh, on this to, to try, if that's what they really want. I know they passed the law, but I think sometimes when they pass these laws, they don't realize what the ramification is to the communities, especially small communities. Yeah. And uh, we're all being faced with it. You know, Homewood has roughly 
37, 3,800 lead service lines to replace in our community. Our total uh, service lines is about 7,000. So, you know, we're almost at half of those uh, that we have to do. And then over a 17 year period, or the feds are talking about changing that to even a 10 year period, mm. which is even worse for right. our communities. So, it's all something that's going to have to be looked at and try to come up with a long-term plan. Oh, for sure, for sure, yeah. for sure. Yeah, I'm not saying the 27 million no, fix this. No, but I just don't I'd have to write a check. Those are some of the big things that are going to be facing the community. Right. No, I just want to make sure because, like, I just remember in 2000 because that's when I first started is uh, in 2009 and the third edition. There were some issues just <laughs> with like pipes that were collapsing and stuff like that that I know we're on top of. I just want to know, like, is that something that's still on our radar screen? It's, it's still there. And just for the board that, that wasn't present during those discussions and everything else, you know, the issue with the third edition is all these sewer and water mains are in the rear yards. There's been garages built on top of them and everything else. So uh, the, the plan was to get all that moved out to the front instead of trying to remove garages and do construction in an existing 10 foot wide easement, it's kind of impossible. So we need to move that infrastructure out to the front of those lots. And that's some of the cost that's involved right. with that. Trustee Colton, so the only planning tool we have as far as projects like this would be the five year capital, which may be more of a 10 year capital plan. We would have to take that project and Absolutely. push it out over a seven, 10 year period. We will definitely have that. In, in oh, for plan. sure. I just want to make sure we don't wait until it's a crisis, so. Cool. Okay, thank you. Trustee Heifer. I remember when we went to two-year budgeting, and that was exciting. It was five years, really. Yeah, it's really something. Um, I, I enjoyed reading it all, and it's really well done. Um, the only thing I see that's glaring at me is I was hoping to see the restriping of 183rd on it, which I don't see. And I know, you know, the new transit-oriented development plan, the 183rd Street studies, general community feeling is that speeding on 183rd is a huge issue and i can't see why we can't figure out a way to to get the re striping done because we're going to lose our grant if we don't actually do it relatively soon and and how could we make that happen does it mean taking the million dollar uh fire vehicle and leasing it instead of paying cash for it there might be some other options that we can do too. Yeah, yeah. We'll definitely take all that into consideration. Mr. Gross, Amy, I just want to thank you for your forward thinking on this five year plan. It, it's helping us make decisions that are very important to the community. Thank you. Trustee <laughs> Roman. Yeah, I agree. Thank you so much. I think that this really um, brought a lot of attention to things that we didn't think about before, um, especially the funding, at least for me personally, the funding for um, everything and the big projects. Um, I joked that I envision you all at a table fighting over who's gonna get the money. Um, and I'm glad that we're just deciding at the end of it, whether or not we approve it and that all the hard decisions have to happen between all of you beforehand. So thank you all very much. Um, and I don't have any questions. You answer all my questions. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Trustee Yes, um, thank you so much, Director Zukowski. Um, I appreciate your time, uh, Mr. Amy's time as well, and meeting with me. Um, I met with you last week which seems forever ago. <laughs> uh, so I'm not sure if you answered this question or not, but why did we not call for a bond if we knew that we needed to get a new fire engine and the price is only gonna escalate? Well, I mean, are we taking that now into consideration as to what's on fire? Not in the literal sense, but, um, um, but why did we not do that? The thought process at the time was we had just finished our audit. We had a very successful audit. We put a lot of additional surplus into our reserve. Um, we captured some of that by updating our uh, fund balance policy from four months to five months. So we, while we had the money available, we kind of secured that by increasing our fund balance minimum. Um, and 
interest rates at the time. We were kind of waiting to see. We had the $2 million available. Um, so the thought process was let's wait and see mm -hmm. um, because we can, we can move forward with the projects that we were intending to fund with the bond with this $2 million of reserve money available. Um, but I think even just putting together this plan, it's clear that that can't really be delayed much longer. Um, the need is definitely there. It's more than there. So. Yeah. I th things are just going to go up in price, mm -hmm. is what Mr. Schaefer said as well. Right. Correct. We're just the longer we to... delay, the more expensive yes. it is. Yeah. And I thank you so much. I appreciate that detailed mm -hmm. response. Um, what I did see on this, I saw it on the I think I don't remember what year it is for the budget for the way signing way finding signs and I also saw it in HARPA funds what's the difference between the two so I think the the funding for the uh, with the ARPA funds ninety thousand dollars that wayfinding signage we're trying to capture as soon as we can that would be downtown signage and the digital kiosk I don't know if either of you want to touch yeah. on that a little bit more I'm not sure um, what the second item she's referring to. Yeah, so there was two hundred thousand dollars put in and out here. So oh, okay. Additional. Yeah. The immediate um, ARPA money, the ninety thousand dollars, we are using. It was um, designed to benefit small businesses, so we're using it for downtown. Um, we see the immediate need as new signs hmm. for the parking lots. So those would be identifying where our parking lots are, and that project we've estimated. Um, uh, we've estimated that cost out as well as putting a um, interactive digital directory in Martin Avenue Square so it would have all of the information in it, all the businesses. You'd hopefully be able to interact with it and, you know, Southgate would appear even though you're not there. You could see where all the parking is and that would be um, centrally located. So those two costs were more immediate. Um, the other, um, the extended wayfinding signage would be replacing our signs that you see that direct you to places. So when there's a sign on the street that shows like village hall this way, parking this way, that would be a, a larger project that would include probably more of the village and um, a lot more signage. And I want to say that's the one for 2027? I think that, yes. Yeah, okay, that, that, that's what I want to make sure years. that I had correct. So we would do that in phases. Okay, and then as far as the art passageway, um, what, has, what does that look like? I can take that. <laughs> so the art passageway, so we have a really unique opportunity. Uh, there's a space between uh, Stony Point and uh, up, what is it? Lulu, Lulu. Lulu Bells. So we, we, we call it a alleyway, but gangway alleyway. So we have a unique opportunity because of its location in downtown to turn it into more of an uh, artistic uh, destination, right? So one of the thoughts we had was light it up with some beautiful LED multicolored lighting. We have some uh, agreements from Stony Point, uh, the Hartford building now, and what's the name of the building next door? Lulu Bell. Bell. We have some agreements to, uh, to allow us to go in there and do just a little bit of construction and uh, install this stuff. So one of them, the lights. The other is that during the daytime, we have some colored um, weather resistant strips. They're like colored, multicolored, that go, will go all the way down the, the uh, corridor. The wind will blow and it looks beautiful. It's just a destination. Something else we talked about, and I think one of our trustees is working on, maybe some um, uh, mural work in the alley. Um, and what else is that? Lights, the pretty stuff. And that's pretty much it. So um, have the good folks that live in the Harper Building and um, Blue Bell and um, our new restaurant, Stony Point, have they seen the renderings of all of this? Not yet, not yet. So, okay. so we haven't shared that yet. We were getting some costs. So we have some costs for the decorative daytime utensils. Um, we're trying to get some costs for the LED lights now, so we're putting it together now. Okay. We'll, we'll have that obligated well before this December. Okay, very good. Um, I'm just throwing this one out there just because I personally think it's an eyesore in the downtown, downtown but with, I know that this is not essential, but the matrix building for that to come down instead of keeping it up and waiting for a developer, I believe we own that. We do. Is it possible to get it developer ready? Do anything like that? 
that's in the works. So in our budget, we don't we don't have anything in the works right now as far as the development. But if you look in our capital plan, we do have uh, some demolition dollars allocated for out years. So when a developer is relevant and, and, and there, we're ready to demolish. So we do have those dollars in for some out But we won't be proactive and knock it down now? No. Is it possible? No. Is that is that an issue with um, the team at Public Works to maintain it since we own it, Mr. Schaefer? Is that uh, yeah, there's always an expense with any property that we own. Uh, you know, we do twice weekly inspections in there. Uh, we have had to replace some windows because of vandalism and things like that. Uh, so. Uh, we do keep, you know, electric to the building, and uh, so yes, there is an expense always, you know. Uh, but as the village manager indicated, there is some dollars set aside in the budget. So if the village board at some point decided they wanted to demolish the building ahead of time, you know, uh, that could definitely be looked at. But that would be a, you know, a board decision on what they wanted to do. Okay. I have to put that out there because with all the other wonderful things that are taking place in the downtown and then it just kind of stops at that space. So thank you. I appreciate it. And um, last, um, I know Trustee Heifelman, he had his wish list um, to the pavers. Um, mine is the fire pit. It's been around for quite some time and uh, needs a facelift. So if there's any proper dollars that are available that we could consider using that. Okay. That's all I have. Thank you. Thank you so much for a yeah. wonderful presentation and meeting with yeah. you. Thank you. And thank you all department heads. And yes, thank you. With all that being said, uh, probably the largest unfunded mandate we ever had is lead line replacement. Uh, thank you, uh, the state of Illinois and uh, the federal government for that. Uh, I myself uh, talked to Amy about delaying the 2024 bond issue in light of uh, high interest rates. Uh, all indications are there will be some movement down June or so, and hopefully by the time we're ready to go uh, at, toward the end of the year, the interest rates will be more favorable. Uh, our needs outweigh it. You talked me into that. <laughs> so again, thank you for a very nice presentation. Thank you. General board discussion. Trustee Lewis. Trustee Cole. Double tonight. Trustee Heiferman. Um, this is the Bergstein's here quietly. They opened. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah. They, 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 they have soft open. Yeah. They've soft open. So. Yeah. Okay. Trustee Harris Jones. Something's okay. Trustee Roman. I was actually also going to comment tonight about um, the traffic at our schools. So thank you very much for coming. Um, I think I'm the only one. I am the only one up here with school age children. I see it every single day at Willow. It is wild. Um, and I hear through our community that it only gets worse at Churchill. Um, my daughter is going to Churchill next year, so I don't experience that one yet. But I mean, it is our responsibility to come up with a solution for this. And I think, you know, it took what happened today to, for me to say something up here. I know people have come up and talked about it and I've echoed their concerns, but something needs to be done. We can't just say drivers are reckless or we can't do this or that because of this reason. There needs to be a solution. I don't know what that solution is, if it's stop signs, if it's speed bumps, if it's more police, whatever it is, but there have been so many close calls that I personally have seen. So I can't imagine how many there are on a daily basis at all three schools. So I just really hope that we can start that conversation and start to come up with a solution. Thank you. Trust the open. I have nothing to add. Thank you. With that, may I have a motion to adjourn, please? So moved. Second. Then moved by Trustee Colton, seconded by Trustee Roman. Roll call, please. Trustee Willis. Aye. Trustee Colton. Aye. Trustee Heifman. Aye. Trustee Harris Jones. Aye. Trustee Roman. Aye. Trustee Oakley. Aye. We stand adjourned. Thank you all. <laughs>